Hi guys, welcome to week one lecture. Um, this is going to be chapter one of week one. So before you can really dive into the exact study of medications, you should know a little bit about the history of pharma pharmacology, as well as some tools that you might use, which we'll get to in subsequent chapters. So following right along with the book, I'm pretty much gonna follow page by page through the book and try to explain some things in my own words that might help you better understand it. Let's start off with why your career field is important. So medical assistants and LPNs are kind of the, sort of the peacekeeper, the middleman, the patient advocate, if you will. They are the person who has direct contact with the patient. They're caring for that patient. They know a lot of information about that patient. They talk to the pharmacist. They talk to their care techs. And they also talk, and then in turn talk to the doctors who are writing orders for the patient. The doctor spends about five to 10 minutes on each patient and the nurse or medical assistant will spend all day long with that patient. So if anybody knows anything about the patient, it's most likely the LPN or the MA. So why is that important? You have the job of basically being the patient's advocate. You speak for the patient when you're talking to the pharmacist or the doctor, and you know important information that we might not otherwise know. So as a pharmacist, how can I help? I am your information source. All the things that you learn in this course, you're not required to remember, you know, it just, it's not feasible for it to be in your mind forever. However, you are required to know what you don't know. So when you don't know something, you look it up or you call a pharmacist. You know what your resources are and you can either look it up in a book online or you can call downstairs to your pharmacy and have them help. Um, so really it's just important to know how to look for what you're missing know how to find information that you need. So chapter one is about consumer safety and drug regulations. Um, if I'm looking to the left, I'm looking at my other computer trying to help um, myself remember what I wanna talk about. Drugs weren't always well studied. In the beginning, drugs existed as, you know, you've heard of a medicine man. There was maybe someone in town that had a lot of knowledge of herbs or certain plants or products that could be used to treat certain illnesses. Um, they weren't studied, they weren't regulated the way they are now. So in the beginning, you would take something and maybe it would work, maybe it wouldn't work. Um, and it wasn't, it could definitely be harmful and you might never see it coming because there was no information out on that. All of it was passed down through word of mouth or apprenticeship. So now we have all these laws and regulations and they started way back in the early 1900s. So, um... 1906 was the Pure Food and Drug Act. This was the first government attempt to establish consumer protection in the manufacture of drugs and foods. There were minimum standards set forth for strength, quality, and purity. It also established references, so now we have a place to look for information. The next major law to be enacted was almost 32 years later, the 1938 Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Amendment. This established the FDA. What is the FDA? The FDA is the Food and Drug Administration, and they are responsible for overseeing um, basically approval of new drugs, regulation of current drugs. They work with the food industry, which we're not even going to get into because I have no idea what they do with that. It's not part of my job to know what they do with that. Um, however, they do provide a lot of insight into our industry as far as um, what drugs might need to be recalled, some information about new adverse reactions or black box warnings. So in 1938, they required that drugs had to be proven safe and effective. Not only did they have to work, they had to not kill the patient or cause them very great harm. It established more rules to prevent the adulteration of medications. You couldn't tamper with them. And there were also some new ideas within this part of the law, such as warning labels. Um, putting labels on a medication that said warning, um, prescription only, or what could possibly happen if you took the drug. In 1970, the Controlled Substances Act. This was very important. We still have issues to this with controlled substances to this day. I don't know if we'll ever get it under control because it seems like whenever they come out with a law or a regulation to help control controlled substances tighter, um, we just come up with a new problem. Uh, so controlled substances are medications that have high potential for abuse or addiction. Medications such as sleeping medications, um, ADHD medications, pain medications, um, a few seizure medications are on that list as well. 
anxiety medications. We need to control these because if they end up in the wrong hands, such as people who they're not intended for, children, etc., they could cause a lot more harm in the long run than if they weren't controlled. So schedules, this is very important. Pay close attention to this one because it is in your project. When you see the word schedule, what it really means is controlled substance. If a drug is a scheduled drug, it means it is a controlled substance. It is a lot more tightly regulated than say a blood pressure medication. And there are consequences for tampering or um, adulterating or trafficking these substances. So schedules one through five, C1 through C5, the higher the, or the lower the number, the more serious the medication. C1 are your illegal medications. These are medications that will never be dispensed by prescription. Heroin, marijuana, ecstasy, you name it, it's on that C1 schedule. If it is not street legal, it is on C1. C2 are medications that have high abuse for, um, high potential for abuse. These are your more serious pain medications, such as your Percocet, your Oxycontin, your ADHD medications. Most of them, in fact, in fact I think all of them are on that schedule. C3 through 5 progressively gets lower in the potential for abuse and addiction. And those are usually your sleeping medications, other pain medications like Percocet, or I'm sorry, other pain medications like Norco or um, some angiolytics like benzodiazepines, your Valium, your Xanax, are all on C3 through C5. So when you're filling out your drug columns and it says schedule, what it's asking for is C1, most likely C2, C2 through C5. Um, so you can find that in your drug reference, your nursing drug reference. You can find that usually at the top, somewhere below the drug name, there's going to be a capital letter C and Roman numerals 2, 3, 4, or 5. Um, with this law in 1970, there was more of a demand for accountability for the storage, transport, and distribution of controlled substances, paper records. These paper records had to be turned in and they were tracked carefully. This law also brought about the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, which is sole responsibility is to um, control controlled substances. It set limitations to the use of prescriptions, how many times a controlled substance could be refilled, how long after the prescription was written it could be refilled, the quantity that was allowed to be dispensed, and it also required that prescribers had a DEA number in order to write for controlled substances. Um, so controlled substance laws, some laws, there's a group of federal laws that exist. There's also a group of state laws that exist. When it comes to controlled substance, we always follow the stricter law. So if the state law is stricter than the federal law, the state law is what holds. Uh, New York has some pretty strict laws, so if you're planning on working in New York, you'll become familiar with some of these. Finally, other acts. 1983 Orphan Drug Act um, provided incentives for developing medications for rare diseases that otherwise might not provide um, drug manufacturers with a lot of return in profits. In addition, OBRA um, 1990 required counseling and documentation of OTC meds in a patient's record. Counseling, meaning every patient who comes through a pharmacy door and picks up a medication, they have to be asked if this medication is new and do they have any questions. In addition, the pharmacist might try to provide some information on that medication. That is now mandatory. If you get caught not doing it, there are consequences and fines that can happen from um, the government. So, OBRA was pretty important for pharmacists. So we talked about schedules and why they're relevant to your project. Um, we talked a little bit about the FDA. We said that it oversees the testing of all new proposed products. It inspects manufacturing plants. It does new drug application reviews. It investigates and removes unsafe drugs from the market and ensures proper labeling of food, cosmetics, and drugs. The DEA, as we mentioned before, um, is concerned only with controlled substances. It enforces, enforces laws against illegal drugs, use, dealing, and manufacturing as well as laws concerning legal drug use, dealing, and manufacturing. It monitors the need to change a drug schedule. For example, tramadol, many years ago when I first started, was, I believe, a C3 maybe, C4, I'm not sure. It's been a while. It is now, um, or I'm sorry, wrong, scratch that. Tramadol, when I started, was not a controlled substance. It was a pain medication. It's similar to Norco in some ways, 
but they didn't believe at that point that the potential for addiction and abuse was as high. It has now been moved into a controlled substance. The exact number off the top of my head, I don't know, but it is now locked up and accounted for. Um, so I think they realized that tramadol, people really started turning to tramadol when laws got tighter. And so now if they can't get their hands on Oxycontin or Norco, at least they can get their hands on tramadol. It was easy. Um, it wasn't a controlled substance. So now it's on that list of controlled substances a lot harder to get a hold of. So that's chapter one. A separate lecture will be available for chapter two, three, and four, as I am limited by um, YouTube as to how long these videos can be. So we'll do chapter two next. And um, if you have any questions on chapter one, always feel free to email me. And we're saying bye for now.